One of the best things about public transport is that the vehicles last a long time. While a 10 year old car is probably feeling pretty tired, a 10 year old bus is in its golden years. And a tram or an electric train can last decades. Not only are transit vehicles built in a more robust way than consumer cars, but they tend to use materials and operate in such a way that they can keep rolling year after year. However, despite this, a lot of cities have a problem with getting rid of their trains and trams long before they need to. Wasting money and CO2 emissions on new trains when the old ones could have kept running. That's bad for the planet and bad for public transport. So let's get into depth on old trains, why they're okay, and why this issue hits so close to home for me. Let's motivate this issue with an example that hits really close to home. A few weeks ago, reports in the media and tweets, a lot of tweets, started pouring in about how the TTC, Toronto's public transit agency, needed to replace a large portion of its subway fleet. Namely, the T1 trains, as well as the signaling on Line 2 where they operate. Lest we experience a catastrophic failure of the subway system. Something which doesn't feel like a completely implausible concern given all of the issues the TTC has had with delays, derailments, and funding over the years. And that's not an issue that's restricted to only Toronto. People reach out to me all the time asking if the transit vehicles in their city really need to be replaced when they're not all that old. And the answer is usually no. So let's look at these trains. The T1s were built from 1995 until the early 2000s meaning that currently they age from their early 20s to nearly 30 years old. Now that seems and feels kind of old, but how it feels doesn't really matter. We need to look at other cities to see how old trains can realistically be and still be in safe operation. The truth is, from New York to Paris to London, far older trains are still in safe and reliable operation. Now, in some cases, like in London on the Piccadilly line, the trains really do feel like they're on their last legs, and that's not a situation you want to be in. But those trains are 50 years old. There's a lot of room between 25-year-old Toronto subway train and 50-year-old 1973 stock. Reality is, much of a train from its body shell to a lot of the electronics can last a very long time. And most of the parts that don't last can and do get replaced on a regular basis, like we saw recently when we visited a streetcar yard. Buying a new train before you need to wastes money, and because you're likely scrapping the old trains, it's also worse for the environment. The parts of a train that passengers actually experience and touch and use can all be completely reimagined in a refurbishment. And looking around the world, best practice generally seems to be running a train for around 20 years, then doing a complete overhaul, including of the passenger experience, and then running it for around another 20 years. That overhaul can include things like installing new wayfinding screens, USB chargers, and better accessibility features. And it's something that cities from Hong Kong to Calgary do, taking decades old trains and making them feel basically new. Even in 2023, it's obvious that information technology moves forward faster than train technology, so it only makes sense that the former should be replaced more frequently than the latter. To be clear, the TTC did do this to an extent with the T1, with new LED internal lighting and outward-facing LED screens. But these are probably the least useful changes you could make for passengers in a train which, in 2023, has no internal screen telling you where you are or where you're going. Now historically with the T1s, a major concern has been the unreliable air conditioners, which sometimes mean hot subway cars during the summer. But you can add new air conditioners and digital wayfinding screens without buying a new train. Acting like you can't is like pretending you need to buy a new house when your fridge breaks. To their credit, the TTC did, as far as I know, study a complete revamp of the trains, but found the value to be too low relative to the costs. But this is just the usual transit cost project. The same cost problems that make building subway systems so expensive in North America are the same ones that make buying new trains or rehabbing old ones very expensive as well. But because that will still impact us whether we rehab or buy new trains, it's something we really need to face head on. Now, the other major concern is the Line 2 signaling, which is the traditional fixed block signaling that subway lines around the world do still safely and reliably use. Now, to be clear, fixed block signaling is probably going to mean higher operating costs, 
lower reliability and less service than with a modern CBTC signaling system. But again, this technology works safely and reliably around the world and in Toronto today. In a place as expensive as Toronto, it's not clear to me that fully upgrading the train fleet and fully re-signaling a subway line is worth it for a new extension that will make up less than 20% of the line's entire length, especially because the TTC already short turns trains on some lines and the terminal of the Scarborough subway extension will still get really good service. Now, while there are real technical issues with old trains and old infrastructure, what really frustrates me is the frivolous and often nonsensical way that these issues are discussed both in the media and by some advocates. To be clear, this is not about nostalgia for old trains. I don't personally have some sort of connection with the T1s. It's about fiscal prudence. We need to prioritize. Transit systems have a lot of things they could spend money on and only so much money. Acting like an early fleet replacement is necessary is not only irresponsible, it could mean that something far more important doesn't get funded. The TTC in particular lists a lot of stuff in its headline capital budget as essential. And this seems to lead to a lot of people talking about these items as if if we don't fund them, the system will suddenly collapse. But the truth is, in Toronto, everyone knows that the TTC isn't going to get its full capital budget, which is tens of billions of dollars, fully funded. Which is why it feels like a huge mistake to talk about things that clearly aren't essential as if they are. We just don't have the money to fund everything we'd like to fund, so we have to prioritize. For example, additional capacity for overcrowded stations where people could fall onto the tracks and risk their lives feels very essential. New trains, when the old trains probably have another 10 or 15 years of life in them, just isn't essential. If London, Tokyo, and Stockholm can figure out how to keep their old trains running, Toronto can too. What's worse though is that a lot of the reports and discourse mention the Scarborough RT, the subway line which Toronto is foolishly removing years before its replacement is ready. I talked about it more in this video. Well, as it turns out, the Scarborough RT closed this year early because of a derailment, which is often talked about in what is frankly an uneducated way, which basically goes, the TTC said the trains were at the end of their lives, so a derailment was inevitable. Of course though, way older trains somehow managed to operate safely on older lines every single day, including in Canada, so this doesn't make sense, it's a red herring. The SRT derailed because it was poorly maintained and it was in a bad state of repair, which would be obvious to anyone who looked at the infrastructure and compared it to say the Vancouver Skytrain, which uses very similar infrastructure. Reporting on the derailment suggests that the problem was poorly tightened bolts that connected to the reaction rail, which lifted up and hit the train. And yet so much of the public discourse is about how this was inevitable because the line was end of life. But that doesn't even make sense for trains or infrastructure. You can essentially keep rehabbing and rebuilding trains and infrastructure forever. It will cost more money, but it's certainly possible. The problem here and with line two is not running older trains. Lots of cities run old and older trains. The problem is not properly maintaining stuff, which can certainly be due to funding, but isn't because of old equipment. What should be concerning is that a poor state of repair, well, that's a problem that can transfer from line to line, including a line that's brand new and has brand new trains. Now, none of this is to say I wouldn't want new trains. The TTC's designs for a second generation Toronto rocket looked really good and had basically every feature I could have wanted. So much so that I wrote an entire article, which I'll link down below, about the trains like a year ago. But this whole situation is a sign of a common problem that advocates face, something which I honestly didn't appreciate and fell into from time to time until a friend shared their thoughts with me about it a couple of years ago. The reality is that just because I want something and it would be an objectively good thing doesn't mean it's the best thing we could be doing. You see, as an advocate, it can be tempting to use the public's concerns about old trains causing derailments to push for new trains. Even if it's bending the truth to say old trains are hazardous or likely to derail because of their age. Bending the truth or needlessly hyperbolizing. Those trains are so old is tempting because it can feel like a path to something better. But this hurts the credibility of transit advocates in a sort of boy who cried wolf way. And I personally think it distracts from the real problems we have. 
like a desire not to refurbish old vehicles like most good transit systems do, or to fight the cost problems that lead to us having more expensive refits and more expensive new trains. Thanks for watching.